to our next um, series of talks. And our first speaker in the session is Dr. Jason Waters. And Jason received his PhD in animal behavior from the University of California at Davis and is currently Vice President of Wellness and Animal Behavior at the San Francisco Zoological Society. His research and publications focus on animal behavior and methods to enhance zoo animal welfare with a concentration on doing this through meeting the animal's behavioral needs. So I want to tell you a story about life in the zoo. Um, this zoo happens to have animals, zookeepers that love them, and it also has a scientist that's pretty into them as well. And an important point that I want people to sort of take home from this story is that for animals that live in the zoo, their lives typically revolve around the behavior of the people that take care of them. It's not necessarily any different than any animal under human care. And I think that one of the things that I want to show you is how this happens in zoos. Okay, let's take a closer look at this. So let's take a look at what these guys do, the two zookeepers that care for these animals. Well, every day, every single day, they arrive at the zoo at about 8 o'clock. They check in with their supervisor, grab their radios and their keys, their tools, and make their way out to the zoo to go see the animals and take care of them. By about 9 o'clock, they're coming down the path that leads to the giraffe enclosure. And there they put the giraffes out, clean their barn, uh, feed them, maybe do a little training, that sort of thing. Then they're on their way to their next animal, the hippo. Whistling down the path, keys clanking, keys, keys jangling, radios cackling. They arrive there at about 11 o'clock, take care of the hippos, and move on. By about 1 o'clock, after taking a, a break for lunch and conversation, they show up at the lion enclosure where they ship the lions around, do a training session, give them another meal, that kind of thing. By 3 o'clock, they make it over to the tiger exhibit, who's probably pretty happy to see them by now. Okay. <clears throat> it's arguable that the animals look forward to the arrival of their keepers or to the things that they're bringing for them, for one reason or another. Situations like these, where positive events are scheduled or reliably cued, are exactly the type of situations that lead to anticipatory behavior. What is anticipatory behavior? And what does it tell us about animal welfare? Well, let's go take a look at it from the perspective of our friend, the tiger. <clears throat> anticipatory behavior is considered an expression of balance. There's been a fair bit of work done on this by a group um, in the Netherlands, Barry Spreutz group. And uh, balance is essentially, sort of, it's a measure of reward sensitivity. And what do I mean by this? The balance between positive and negative experiences in an animal's day is a sensible measure of welfare. We were just talking about that a little bit in the discussion uh, after following David's talk. Somebody brought up, I was standing back there, so I don't know who said it, but somebody mentioned that sometimes there are negative moments in an animal's day. Well. When those outbalance the positive moments, that's when we have a significant welfare situation on our hand. Animals who on average have a lack of positive opportunities tend to become reward sensitive. They really look forward to the positive opportunities that are coming, okay, to the few rewards that they might get. 
While a lack of opportunities to engage in positive rewarding behavior is not the same as being engaged in negative harmful behavior, it is not neutral. And a welfare balance sheet that indicates a more frequent lack of opportunities than chances to engage is one that should be considered a deficit. And anticipatory behavior may be a way for us to listen to the animals to sort of read this balance sheet, if you will, to let them tell us what their balance sheet says. What does it generally look like? It could be increased activity at the onset of the queue that suggests that the reward is about to become available. We might see this in, in uh, various zoo animals at certain times of the day. It might look like other things as well. If we were to take a look at sort of a balance between frequency of positive and negative experiences in an animal's day, essentially the animal's welfare state, we might be able to sort of take, get a, a, a guess at what the behavior might look like. So when an animal's in a sort of a very positive state of balance, if you will, where it has lots of positive opportunities in the day, it might be over there on the left, and there might be lots of expressions of anticipatory behavior, but they might be fairly sort of low intensity. On the other hand, when things get out of balance and an animal sort of needs a positive experience, it might demonstrate that it needs that with a high intensity sort of expression of anticipatory behavior. Eventually, when things get so bad <clears throat> that the animal has very infrequent positive opportunities, it might be in a sort of a chronic stress situation and everything might fall down a little bit. Let's take a look at this red star here and sort of see if we can imagine what this behavior might look like when we're at a situation where we're pretty out of balance, we need these positive rewards, and we know when it's coming. <laughs> I really be ramped up about it. I'm excited. On the other hand, if we go and take a look at the behavior at the green star, where we have regular and consistent sort of rewarding days, we might not be at balance, but we might still express. So where does a scientist come into this story? Well, he's crazy about animals too. And he wants to help us to figure out good ways to assess how they're doing, to read their behavior. He wants us to help develop tools. And he has an idea that if he can help to sort of clarify the cues associated with the positive coming events, we might be able to describe what anticipatory behavior looks like <clears throat> and develop a way to sort of regularly assess how our animals are doing by asking them how they're feeling, essentially. So one of the things that we started doing in my lab is using an audible cue. You see the note here that this guy is holding up that tells the animal when the positive event is coming. And we're trying to see if we can observe anticipatory behavior so that we can describe it, see what it looks like, and see what it's telling us about the animals. We also know a lot about the animals and sort of their enrichment programs, all these types of things. And we have an understanding of how frequent these positive events are in their days, if you will. Okay, so in the next video, I'm going to show you, you're going to hear this audible cue and 
usually in the videos on sort of the left hand side you'll see the animal on the right hand side is the area where the positive event will come you're not going to see this positive event i'm only going to show you sort of a potential idea of what we might expect to see develop over time as we do these experiments so you got to look close um, <clears throat> Here's the cue, over there on the left, somewhere, the red panda. This is the first pass. Another one. So after some time, we expect that he might start to show us that he's interested. In this positive. And here's a different animal. First time, second time here. starting to try and describe what this behavior might look like and uh, we're doing it in lots of different species so our scientist friend he wants some help right he wants all the scientists in the zoo business to get together and work on this um, because really it's going to take some time to be able to develop this as a tool to utilize for understanding how our animals are doing and you can imagine that there's some, some really neat experiments that you might actually be able to do in front of your zoo guests, in front of the people that come to these places. We can ask interesting questions and sort of market it to the zoo guests as we're trying to evaluate, uh, you know, the abilities of these animals to say, see specific colors or how good their vision is, or, you know, there's lots of different things. There's, cues come in all different sorts of sensory forms and if we can couple these to positive events it could be really fun to do this in front of our guests while we're also looking at how our animals are doing so thank you very much for listening and that is the end of the story